Okay, so let's begin. So today is the fall uh, 2020 Federal Communications Commission's um, Consumer Advisory Committee meeting, the CAC. Uh, this will be our last meeting for the 10th charter. And let me quickly go through some guidelines before we uh, begin the session and uh, do roll call. So again, as I've stated uh, a couple of times now, uh, if I could have all the members and presenters uh, mute your audio and turn off your video unless you're actively speaking. Uh, when we take questions, please use the hand raising function of Zoom to request to be recognized. Uh, once you're recognized by me, then please turn your video and unmute your audio to speak. Then please pause a couple seconds before you speak or before you start a slide presentation for those presenters, just to ensure that everyone has access before you proceed. And then when you begin, please, please identify yourself by name and your organization before speaking. Uh, then turn off your video and mute your audio when you're done. Always remember to pause before moving along so everyone is on board. Uh, we have interpreters um, and we, we don't want the screens to be jumping around, so we want everything to be stated for that purpose. So uh, with that, I want to thank all the members and alternates and uh, staff and presenters and, and the public for joining in the event uh, today. I hope everyone is healthy and keeping safe during these unprecedented times. So uh, now I'd like to call the meeting into order. Uh, we have a tight schedule today. So in a few moments, uh, we'll have remarks from uh, the FCC Chairman Ajit Pai and Commissioner Carr, followed by FCC staff presentations and updates consisting of four panels. The panels will include a COVID-19 challenges update, uh, combating robocalls, advancing emergency response capabilities, and promoting the 21st century technologies and services. Then we'll open the floor for discussion with the members and then to the public before wrapping up and adjourning. So that's the agenda for today. So uh, before beginning the agenda then, let's take roll. So um, as I call your name, please turn on your audio and your video back on, then pause a second or two, state your name, your organization's name, and then mute your audio and turn off your video. It'll take a bit of time to do this, but it's very important that you get counted on the public record. Um, so I'm gonna begin by, um, of course, introducing myself again. I'm Steve Posiosk. Uh, I'm with the, uh, I'm chair and I'm with the American Consumer Institute. And uh, I'd like to call on right now, the CAC's vice chair, Deborah Berlin. Deborah, uh, can you join us, please? Yes, hi. Welcome, it's Debbie Berlin, Vice Chair representing the National Consumers League. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Um, so that's it. present. Uh, let me call, go through organizations and again, toggle on. If you're not active, toggle off. So AARP, uh, do we have a representative there? I'm, and I'm, what I'm looking for, uh, the primary representative. And if there isn't one there, please, the alt uh, alternate uh, step in. So uh, AARP. Dawid Kasai, AARP. Thank you. Uh, do we have a representative from America's Communications Association? Yes, uh, Brian Hurley with ACA Connects, America's Communications Association. Okay. Um, again, um, like I've mentioned a couple of times, remember to turn off your audio and video um, if, you're, if you're not speaking. Do we have uh, someone from the American Legislative Exchange Council? Jonathan Howard Schultz. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and Americans for Tax Reform. Uh, can you turn on your audio and video? And uh, hey, Steve, Katie here. Hi, Katie. 
Do we have a representative from the Appalachian Regional Commission? Hi, Mark DeFalco is here, no video, but I am present and accounted for. Thank you, Mark. Uh, AT&T, do we have a representative online? Good morning, this is Vonda Long, AT&T. Yes, good morning. Uh, call for action, do we have a representative? Call for action. So let's move on to the Consumer Federation of America. Irene Leach is present with the Consumer Federation of America. Morning, Irene. Do we have a representative from the Consumer Technology Association? Good morning, this is Rachel Nemeth from CTA. Good morning. Do we have a representative from Consumer Reports? Consumer Reports. Let's move on. Do we have a representative from CTIA? Hi, Steve. This is Sarah Legan for CTIA. Good morning, Sarah. Uh, remember again um, to always uh, turn off your audio and video uh, once you're done speaking. Do we have a representative from the Deaf and Hard Hearing Consumer Advocacy Network? Hello. This is Zainab al Kebzi with the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Consumer Advocacy Network. Good morning. Do we have a representative from the Digital Policy Institute? Good morning, Steve and everyone else. Barry Umansky with the Digital Policy Institute. Good to hear from you, Barry. Good to be here. Do we have Eric Cook? Good morning, everyone. This is State Senator Eric Cook of Indiana serving as a special government employee subject matter expert. Thank you, Eric. Johnny Campus, are you there? Yes, sir. If I can get my video to start working, <laughs> I am here. Okay. Johnny is a special government uh, employee um, as a subject matter expert. Uh, and so is Kyle. Kyle Hildebrand, are you on the line? Kyle, do we have a representative? Morning, Steve. Can, Steve, Kyle Hildebrand, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, Thank good you. to hear you. Do we have a representative from the Massachusetts Department of Telecommunications and Cable? You do, Steve, good morning. Jocelyn Day, Massachusetts Department of Telecom and Cable. Wonderful to hear from you. Uh, Michael Santorelli, are you here? Michael? Do we have a representative from the Milwaukee PBS? Good morning, Steve. This is Bodan Zachary on behalf of Milwaukee PBS. Thank you. Do we have a representative from the National Association of Broadcasters? Hi, Steve. This is Larry Walk from NAB. 
Good to hear from you. Do we have a representative from the National Association of State Utility Consumer Advocates? Uh, good morning. This is Barbara Burton representing Lasuka. Gotcha. Wonderful. Good to hear you. Good morning. Now, do we have anyone from the National Consumer Law Center? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Olivia Wine, National Consumer Law Center. Nice to hear from you. We have a representative from NCTA. Hi, this is Steve Morris from NCTA. Good morning. Do we have a representative from the Trevor Project? Hey y'all, it's me, Sam Brinton. I use they and them as my pronouns and I'm the Vice President of Advocacy and Government Affairs for the Trevor Project. Good to see you. And lastly, we have US Telecom. We have a representative online. Yes, Lynn Follinsby is here for US Telecom. Okay. So let me just take a moment here. If, um, if I missed anyone, uh, please raise your hand uh, through the Zoom feature so I can identify who you are. Hopefully I have everyone. And so with that, uh, we have a quorum. So let's begin the agenda. We have a lot to do and um, I'd like to uh, move on as quick as possible. So um, let's start um, and let me just say good morning to everyone again. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the FCC chairman, Ajit Pai. Well, thanks so much uh, for that introduction uh, to Steve and it's great to see everybody on the call. I wish, of course, uh, that we could be gathering together in the FCC's new headquarters, but of course, uh, given the current situation, we're not able to do that. But nonetheless, it's great to see everybody virtually. Um, I also wanna thank everybody for serving on the Consumer Advisory Committee with a special thanks to, of course, our chair, uh, Steve Posiak, and our vice chair, uh, Deborah Berlin, for their thoughtful and inclusive style of leadership. Uh, Steve and Deborah, along with the full membership, have made really valuable contributions to the FCC's decision-making uh, during this iteration of the CAC. And I know uh, that it, is, it takes a lot of time and effort and I wanna thank you for doing that. Um, I also wanna thank the working group chairs for all of their leadership efforts. Uh, for example, the co-chairs Brian Young and Kansas's own Sam Brinton of the critical call, and, call list and call blocking working group. Uh, the co-chairs Michael Santarelli and Thaddeus Johnson from the Caller ID Authentication Working Group. Uh, the co-chairs Chris, Dr. Christina Pusak and uh, Linda Vandeloup of the Robocall Report Working Group. And co-chairs uh, Vonda Long Dillard and Jocelyn Day of the Truth in Billing Working Group. Uh, for each of you who have been herding the cats on those respective working groups, much uh, appreciation from me and from the FCC. Uh, speaking of FCC, in addition, I want to thank the FCC staff who have been working with the Consumer Advisory Committee, in particular, the folks from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau who help everything run smoothly. They serve, of course, as the liaison between the broader FCC and you, uh, and they've made presentations through to the committee and its working groups. And in particular, uh, Scott Marshall, who is the Designated Federal Officer, or DFO, as well as uh, Greg Halegian, the Deputy Designated DFO. Uh, you know, when in doubt, it's always good to have a DFO or DDFO with you. Uh, finally, I want to thank all of you for, again, the time and the effort, the ideas and the consensus building that went into the recommendations that you submitted to us during this term of the CAC. Since the beginning of my time as chairman, fighting illegal robocalls has been our top consumer protection priority. Uh, this is something that, of course, has driven consumers crazy for many, many years, has consistently been our top category of consumer complaints. But every step of the way, you have partnered with us to help find practical solutions that help us help consumers uh, to combat this scourge. At the upcoming September meeting, we'll consider an order at the FCC that takes the next steps forward towards shake and stir implementation. And in particular, this order would establish rules governing the intermediate providers and caller ID authentication in non-IP, non-internet protocol networks. 
Specifically, it would require voice service providers to either upgrade their non-IP networks to IP and implement Stir Shaken, sorry, Stir Shaken, or work to develop a non-IP authentication solution. It would also enact pro-consumer provisions of the Trace Act, like the prohibition of line item charges for caller ID authentication. Uh, now that's of course going forward, uh, looking backward, you've been really productive uh, during this committee term. And uh, here are just a few of the highlights and time of course doesn't permit me to go through all of them. But uh, in particular, I want to highlight a robocall blocking. Uh, last September, you adopted a recommendation addressing how best to educate consumers about the types of robocalls that may be blocked and possible mechanisms that would be used by voice providers uh, to notify them that particular calls have been blocked. And this is something that was really important to helping us. I think about these issues. Also, caller ID authentication. Last December, you adopted a recommendation regarding how best to educate consumers about the meaning of the shake and stir caller ID authentication framework. You also advised us on some of the most important factors that providers should think about when they are displaying authentication and other information about the call to consumers. It's of course one thing for providers to have that information, but what really matters is communicating that information in a way that's digestible to the uh, typical consumer who needs that information. Uh, next, the robocall report, which was of course consistent with the CAC's prior recommendation that you adopted in September of 2018. Uh, you helped us lay the groundwork for a robocall report on the availability and effectiveness of call blocking solutions, including advanced methods and tools to eliminate unwanted or illegal calls, as well as the impact of call blocking on 911 and public safety. You provided us with helpful suggestions regarding sources of data, uh, the need to use consistent definitions that distinguish between unwanted and illegal calls, and the clarification of which tools are network-based versus those that are consumer-initiated. Uh, all in all, you've done a lot, but I can tell you that this work really makes a difference. I remember still a town hall that I did with seniors uh, that was hosted in part by the AARP in Omaha a couple of years ago, or sorry, Lincoln, I believe it was. And uh, just to hear how much angst they had about this issue, but also how much heart they took that they knew the FCC and consumer advocacy groups like you were on their side, helping them try to find solutions. It really meant a lot. And so the you know, the enthusiasm we heard in that room for some of the work we've been doing on robocalls, I'm sure is replicated across the country. And as our cooperative efforts go forward, the FCC with some of those, the items that I've discussed and the CAC with some of the recommendations you've pursued, I'm quite confident that consumers will be in good stead in the uh, time to come. So again, I appreciate all of your efforts. You've contributed to our work in meaningful ways. And I know it's uh, been a lot of work, but it's a pleasure to be with you uh, here today. And I look forward to uh, speaking with those of you who've expressed an interest in continuing your work on the next uh, CAC, which we'll be announcing soon. So uh, thanks again. Uh, sorry for hogging the microphone for so long, but uh, all the best wishes to Steve, to Deborah, and the entire team uh, on in your deliberations today. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for your remarks. Um, we have a couple minutes if we have questions. Um, and, and, and by the way, um, I did hear uh, just uh, offline here that Michael uh, Santorelli is on the roll and I, I missed you, so uh, we have you counted off. But uh, if anyone has questions, you have to raise your hand uh, and I'll recognize you. Hopefully that feature is working. I don't know if I've missed anyone. Okay, well, Chairman. Hey. If only congressional hearings were this way, my life would be a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I, I, I really do appreciate you coming out. It, it's, as always, uh, your remarks are insightful and, and very kind, uh, giving us uh, due consideration and, and recognition. Thank you so much for coming today. Well, thanks again, Steve, and hope all of you stay safe and be well in the time ahead. Thank you. So, um, now let's turn our attention to our next esteemed speaker, FCC Commissioner uh, Brendan Carr. Steve, this is Scott uh, with the FCC. 
uh, I'm trying to put a phone call into uh, uh, Commissioner Carr's office right now. Okay. So what we can do is um, we'll just start in at any point we can interrupt uh, and allow the commissioner to uh, uh, to speak. Does that make sense then, Scott? Yes, that's great. Okay. So, um, so now let's just uh, move on with our four panels. Our first panel uh, will be uh, addressing the COVID-19 challenges. So uh, let me um, introduce the first speaker um, who will discuss accessibility during the pandemic is Diane Bernstein, the Deputy Chief of Consumer Government Affairs Bureau. Diane, are you there? So I guess we can come back to that too. Um, so let's go with the second speaker. Uh, this is the COVID-19 scam alerts and updated consumer guidelines by uh, Ed Thalmiel, the associate chief um, over at the Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau. Ed, are you on? Can you guys see me? Yes, we can okay. see you, Ed. Go ahead, please. Um, so good morning, everyone, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to present and share some of the important work our education and outreach teams have been doing in response to the pandemic. Back in April, I shared that we were tracking coronavirus scams, and with the help of the Enforcement Bureau, other federal and state partners like the FTC and DOJ, as well as industry and analytics companies, we've been able to continue to track emerging COVID-19 scams and publicize the tactics being used by fraudsters. New variations and pandemic-themed hooks continue to evolve and often mirror news headlines. Early examples would mention generic test kits as a concept. More recent scams refer to antibody testing, so a much more specific hook that was kind of taken from headlines. State and local contact tracing efforts have also spawned scams where fraudsters used phone calls and text messages to collect personal information or advance payment for required tests under the guise of contact tracing. Some of these scams were even spoofing local health department and contact tracing center numbers. Contact tracing as a sort of as a concept presents a unique messaging challenge. Um, our guidance, along with the FTC, state AGs, and many consumer groups, has long been don't answer calls from unknown numbers. Um, contact tracing calls are going to be an unknown number, and time's often a factor, and you want consumers to answer those calls. Uh, so in our consumer alert, we remind consumers to never click on links and text, text messages from unknown senders, and to remember that legitimate contact tracers will not ask for insurance information bank account information, credit card numbers, social security numbers, or payments. If a caller does ask for that sort of information, you just need to hang up. One second, sorry. The guide also contains other useful tips to spot and identify contact tracing scams. Uh, we also released a, a post earlier this year on COVID scams that target older Americans. We rolled this out in May, which as many of you know is Older Americans Month. Um, and then recently, earlier this month, we put up a post about pharmacy scams that have been resurfacing with a COVID theme. As our coronavirus consumer content has grown, the team developed a new page layout for our FCC.gov slash COVID hyphen scams page. Um, that page is up on the slide here, so you can take a look. Uh, it continues to have audio from scam calls, examples of scam text, 
as well as more targeted alerts on particularly pernicious scams. The page also houses our phone hygiene or how to clean your device poster and guide, along with our home network optimization guide. The page has been visited over 120,000 times since it launched. In an interesting wrinkle, we're seeing a reduction in unwanted call complaints and analytics companies have continued to report a drop off in unwanted call volume since March. Recent reports are indicating an upward trend in call volume, but they still remain below pre-March pre levels. One recent report mentioned that political campaign calls have stepped in to fill some of the void left by scammers in this election year. Keep an eye out for an updated version of our political call and text guide to be released soon. Uh, next slide, please. So you may have noticed that our cell phone shaped character Mo has been making appearances in many of our consumer themed social media posts and online. Uh, the slide up now shows our how to clean your device poster featuring Mo and tips like unplug your device before cleaning, use a lint free cloth, um, and Mo's acting out many of the corresponding tips on the poster. Next slide. This is our back to school graphic. Um, it shows Mo with a backpack, mask, and other communication themed items a student in 2020 may need. Uh, the graphic promotes our back to school guide at fcc.gov backslash back hyphen to hyphen school. The guide aggregates a number of existing FCC consumer resources to help students and parents as they navigate the new school year, whether in person, online, or a hybrid approach. It contains a list, uh, sorry, it contains a link to a list of providers that have gone above and beyond the Keep Americans Connected pledge to serve their communities. A number of those providers still have offers um, available to households with students. Beyond our online education content, our dedicated outreach team has been helping to spread the word on COVID-19 scams and our resources. Their bi-monthly newsletters have featured articles on contact tracing scams, phone cleaning, and COVID scams, and their monthly partner calls have featured presenters on these topics. In addition, they've generated a number of timely email blasts to keep consumers informed. If you're not getting their emails, newsletters, or monthly partner call updates, please email outreach at fcc.gov to be added to the list or follow up with Scott and he will connect you with the team. Beyond scams, we've also updated the Lifeline and E-Rate consumer guides to reflect COVID-19 related waivers and extensions. And the fcc.gov backslash coronavirus webpage has an updated list of the FCC's response and actions taken in response to the pandemic. Pivoting away from COVID, as you can see from the agenda today, and as you'll hear from a number of my colleagues as the meeting progresses, the FCC has also been very productive on a broad set of communication issues over the past few months. To share a few of the other education and outreach highlights, uh, I wanted to sort of tee up that over the summer, we launched a new consumer guide and social media campaign on SIM swapping, port out scams and other cell phone frauds. To help mark Lifeline Awareness Week earlier this month in collaboration with our Disability Rights Office, we launched an ASL version of the Lifeline Consumer Guide. Um, our Office of Engineering and Technology released an updated FCC speed test app for consumers and that's available in both the iPhone and Android app stores. And I just wanted to also slip in a quick plug for an upcoming public event. On October 8th at 2 p.m., the FCC will live stream a panel discussion to mark the 10th anniversary of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, or the CVAA. The panel will be followed by the 2020 Chairman's Awards for Advancement in Accessibility, which this year, for the first time, will honor the contributions of individuals to, the communicate, to communications accessibility. Previous awards had recognized specific technology achievements. Um, this year, we're sort of honoring people for their contributions through their, through their work in the field. I wanna end by thanking you all for your dedication over the last two years 
the guidance you share and the recommendations you make is appreciated. And I hope that you'll please continue to stay in touch and reach out and let us know when and where we can be of help. Thanks. All right, uh, this is Steve. Um, thank you, Ed, for that. Um, so it looks like we're gonna have um, um, Commissioner Carr uh, on in, in probably about 10 minutes or so. Um, and um, we do have D Diane on. Um, so what I was thinking is, um, Diane, uh, before you, uh, uh, you start off with uh, your part and then, then we can move on to uh, Haley, uh, maybe we should just take um, uh, like a, a nine, 10 minute uh, break. Um, what do you think? We'll just do that and we'll come back and and um, if the commissioner is ready, we'll start. Otherwise, we can go right back to um, uh, panel A. Does that make sense? So let's just do that. Uh, let's just get back in about uh, nine minutes. Thank you. Steve, Steve yes. it's yeah. Debbie. I, I, sorry, I can't find my hand raising function here on my computer. Um, but will we have an opportunity to ask questions of um, Ed and others? Yes, we're going to have questions at the end of each panel. Okay. And uh, maybe when we take a break, can you just tell me where my hand raise function is? Because I have searched everywhere on my thing here. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll take a break and maybe uh, if Gerard's on, he can probably walk you through it. Okay. Great. Super. Thank you. Uh, this is David Saratsky from the FCC. I want to be... Um, co-hosts behind the scenes. Uh, if anyone wants to use the hand raising function, there's a reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's a smiley face with a little plus. And if you click that, there's a little waving hand uh, on the left side of the pop-up menu. Um, so that's where you can find the hand raising function. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, well, let's just take a quick break and we'll be right back. One. So, um, now, uh, let me turn your attention to our next uh, speaker, a steam speaker, I should say, our FCC Commissioner, uh, Brendan Carr. Uh, Commissioner, um, if you can uh, please make sure your uh, video and audio are turned on and, and then um, pause a second before beginning. Thank you so much for your remarks. One minute, we're waiting. I think he just stepped away, Steve. He should be back shortly. Okay. So following this, then what we will do um, is uh, we'll continue with uh, panel A and um, uh, Diane uh, Bersine will be talking about the accessibility during the uh, pandemic, and she has some slides for us to cover. So uh, we'll do that uh, in just a, a couple minutes. <clears throat> what time was your was our break supposed to end, Steve? Um, I didn't. I didn't really set a, a firm time. I I just said okay. you know <laughs> nine yeah. or ten minutes. Right. Yeah, because I think the screen's at 11.15, as I recalled. So so that may be when the commissioner will return. Yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah, we can we can hold for another minute.
Okay, well, I'll tell you what, um, hopefully everyone is back um, and we're ready to go again. Um, so let's let's do this. Um, you know, while, while we're waiting for, um, let me see if I can check here. Um, while we're waiting for the uh, commissioner to return, um, would you be available, um, Diane, to, to start with your uh, portion of the presentation? Hi, good morning, Steve. Yes, and I'll just um, pause if the uh, commissioner comes back on and let him proceed, if that's okay. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, sure, no problem. Thank you for having me this morning. And um, I also wanted to bring uh, remarks from uh, Patrick Weber, CGB's chief, who unfortunately couldn't be here today to address the group, but he um, wanted me to pass along his appreciation for all the important work that the CAC has done um, and has accomplished during this term. So thank you um, on behalf of Patrick for that. Um, I'm Diane Burstein, Deputy Bureau Chief of CGB. And this morning I was going to spend a few minutes talking about what um, CGB has been doing during the pandemic to ensure the accessibility uh, of information for people with disabilities. Um, once the pandemic hit, CGB took action to ensure the uninterrupted provision of telecommunications relay services or TRS. Um, providers of various different forms of TRS were experiencing a number of different issues. First of all, there was a sharp increase in traffic levels as more people were working from home and using the telephone for longer periods of time. Um, due to social distancing and stay at home orders, there was also a sharp reduction in the number of employees called communications assistants who ordinarily could handle calls from uh, call centers uh, due to these restrictions. So in March, the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau granted a waiver order that, among other things, relaxed a number of rules to allow more CAs to work from home um, and to make certain operational changes in order to deal with the pandemic. Um, we've later granted a waiver to expand the pool of people who could provide American Sign Language interpreting to ensure that um, there was sufficient capacity there. And uh, given the absence of material changes uh, in the coronavirus and various restrictions, we've extended the waivers several times, including most recently until November 30th of this year. Uh, next slide, please. On the video side, we also took measures to ensure that people had access to emergency information. Um, and under the FCC's emergency information rules, critical details about the pandemic, such as sheltering in place areas that are affected by emergencies, evacuation routes and the like, must be presented both orally and visually. Um, if presented in the video portion of a newscast, for example, it must be made available for blind people by orally describing um, in, the, uh, in the main audio what's being presented visually. And when it interrupts another program through use of a crawl, for example, with emergency information, uh, it has to be accompanied by an oral tone and then conveyed orally in a secondary audio stream so that blind people get these critical details. Um, emergency information that's provided in the audio must also be accessible to deaf uh, viewers through closed captioning or visual presentation method. We also made clear that um, 
there are a number of instances where state and local governments present sign language interpreters on the screen. And the best practice is to make sure that the sign language interpreter is visible in order to benefit viewers who use American Sign Language. Uh, next slide, please. In addition, uh, in May, the FCC and the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency released a letter to uh, the governors and DC mayor about uh, providing access to certain essential workers to ensure they have appropriate resources and access to facilities. And as part of that, uh, businesses and personnel that provide communication support to people with disabilities, as well as TRS providers and closed captioning providers were mentioned. In short, we've been doing a lot to make sure that there's uninterrupted services during the pandemic. And um, as part of your packet today, we list the resources that you can uh, reach out to in case you need assistance uh, with those measures uh, and how to contact the Disability Rights Office. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions later. Great. Um, yeah, we have one more um, uh, speaker for this panel. Um, so, David, uh, did you um, mention that uh, the commissioner is available? Yes, he is. So, I leave it to you, Steve, about uh, whether you want to uh, ask the commissioner to speak or continue with the panel. I'm ready. Uh, let's just interrupt it um, and, and allow the commissioner to uh, come on. I, uh, I, I'm i really pleased uh, that he was able to do this, and we really look forward to his remarks. So, uh, Commissioner, if you're able to uh, join us, uh, uh, please uh, unmute and, and start your video. Thank you. Thanks. Can you hear me? I think I got my audio on, but it doesn't look like it's letting me un put my video back on yet. All right. Looks like we're good to go now. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Apologize for the, the confusion. I had a few meetings that were running uh, over top of each other there. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to address the group and thank you so much for really the public service that you all are doing. I know you have uh, day jobs and are very, very busy uh, and taking on this additional work is really important. Uh, I think obviously as we're all addressing each other remotely, uh, that you know just highlights how much of our world has changed with COVID-19 and almost just overnight uh, our lives shifted onto the internet for meetings, for educating our kids, for telehealth. Um, and we saw just a massive spike in internet usage. Um, I know you all are talking a little bit today about telehealth and um, it's really been amazing to me to see just a massive uptake in telehealth usage um, with COVID-19. I've had a chance to visit with healthcare providers that have used FCC COVID funding from Nevada to Michigan, Ohio, I was in Florida last week, um, and to a person, every single one of these providers talk about going from almost no telehealth visit or a handful of telehealth visits to just an order of magnitude increase in a matter of weeks. And they continue to tell us that without the FCC support, they wouldn't have been able to do that. So I think the focus that you have on telehealth here is going to be very important. And the focus you bring on the consumer, at the end of the day, you know, that's absolutely why we do everything we can at the FCC is to uh, improve the lives of the consumers that are using these full ranges of telehealth and telecommunications services. So I don't want to sidetrack too much from the panel other than to say how grateful I am uh, for the service that you all do. It's, it's noticed, we watch, we observe everything that you all do, your recommendations, even just the comments that you all make, um, and we filter that into our decision making at the FCC. So 
uh, thank you so much for your work on this. And I'm particularly interested in some of the, uh, the telehealth work that'll be coming out. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. This is Steve again. Um, uh, as we explained, I think David explained earlier, uh, at the bottom of the Zoom, there is a uh, reactions button. So, um, you know, uh, if you have any questions for the commissioner, um, you're able to uh, hit that button and there's a, a, a sign to wave and I'll recognize you and we can um, uh, get a question or two in uh, while, while we still have the commissioner here online. Yeah, happy to do it. I can't, I can't really see anything for sure, Commissioner. <laughs> I mean, I, um, I don't see any questions. So I think we're pretty well set though. Um, look, I, I, I wanna thank you so much for uh, uh, your service and what you've done uh, this year. And, uh, and I appreciate your comments and, and guidance to uh, the group. So um, thank you and um, um, have a great weekend. Thank you, I really appreciate it, thanks. Okay, so um, let's just, let's do this if we may. Um, we have one more speaker here on the uh, panel A. And um, let's do this. Uh, let's, let's have that speaker now, and then um, we'll move on uh, back to the agenda as we were. So what we're gonna talk about today, uh, we have a presentation uh, on the update of telehealth initiatives, a really important topic from Haley Steffen, the attorney advisor of telecommunications uh, access and policy division. Now that's with the Wireline Competition Bureau. Um, let me turn it over to Haley. Thanks, Steve. Uh, can everyone hear me? Steve, maybe you can confirm. I think. Um, all right. Uh, I'm Haley Steffen. Uh, I'm an attorney advisor in WCB, uh, the Telecommunications Access and Policy Division. Uh, and like uh, Steve said, I will be presenting on um, update on the FCC's telehealth initiatives um, and talking a bit about the COVID-19 telehealth program that Commissioner Carr just mentioned and our upcoming uh, Connected Care Pilot Program. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. All right, so the COVID-19 telehealth program originated out of the uh, CARES Act that uh, Congress passed at the end of March. Congress appropriated the FCC $200 million to help eligible healthcare providers um, in their provision of connected care services during the COVID-19 pandemic. After uh, Congress passed the CARES Act, the commission acted swiftly and adopted a report and order on April 2nd, 2020. The report and order established the COVID-19 telehealth program. Uh, shortly thereafter, the commission started to accept applications from um, on April 13th, 2020. The commission accepted applications between April 13th and June 25th, and uh, the commission we received thousands of applications. Uh, we prioritized funding um, to eligible healthcare providers who were located in areas that were hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic and where the funding would have the most impact. On July 8th, 2020, uh, the commission exhausted the 200 million in appropriated funds, ended um, up uh, issuing 539 funding commitments to healthcare providers in 47 states plus Washington DC and Guam. Uh, for more information about the COVID-19 telehealth program, you can visit www.fcc.gov slash COVID dash 19 dash telehealth dash program. Uh, like I said, we're, um, the commission has committed all the funds 
we're currently in the invoicing stage of the program, which means that healthcare providers are submitting their invoices and um, the commission is uh, reimbursing them for those uh, eligible services and devices. Next slide, please. So the Connected Care Pilot Program is the upcoming telehealth initiative from the commission. Uh, it is the result of a almost two year rulemaking process that started in 2018, um, uh, initiated by Commissioner Carr through a notice of inquiry. And um, the notice of inquiry just basically asked how the commission could you know, examine how telehealth uh, could be expanded and how the Universal Service Fund could use funds to expand the provision of telehealth. There was a report, or there was a notice of proposed rulemaking last summer, and with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that kind of expedited um, the Connected Care Pilot, and the Connected Care Pilot was established in the same report and order as the COVID-19 telehealth program on April 2nd. The pilot program is a limited duration program that will make available up to $100 million of universal service support over a three-year funding period to help defray healthcare providers' qualifying costs of providing connected care services, particularly to low-income Americans and veterans. Um, and unlike the uh, COVID-19 telehealth program, connected care uh, is under the legal authority of the Universal Service Fund, like the other uh, USF programs on um, the commission administers. So there are uh, a lot more regulatory rules and regulations attached to the Connected Care Pilot that were not necessarily attached to the COVID-19 telehealth program. Next slide, please. So who can apply? Uh, like I said, because uh, the Connected Care Pilot will be under the legal authority of Section 254 of the Telecommunications Act. The um, participants who are eligible to apply are healthcare providers in 254. Uh, this list is listed in 254 and it includes, um, includes post-secondary educational institutions offering healthcare instruction, teaching hospitals and medical schools, community health centers or health centers providing healthcare to, to migrants, local health departments or agencies, community mental health centers, not-for-profit hospitals, rural health clinics, skilled nursing facilities, or consortia of healthcare providers consisting of one or more entities falling into the first seven categories. Um, interested applicants can determine whether they're eligible, whether they fall into one of those categories by filing an FCC Form 460 which is available on the Universal Service uh, Administrative Company's ESAC's website. Uh, the services that will be eligible will be 85% uh, of the qualifying costs of patient broadband internet access services, healthcare provider broadband data connections, other connected care information services, and certain network equipment. The pilot program will not fund end user devices or medical equipment. So this is one of the differences between the Connected Care Pilot and the COVID-19 telehealth program. Connected Care will not be able to fund end user devices such as tablets or smartphones. Um, that's one of the biggest differences. You go to the next slide. The application for the Connected Care Pilot program is not yet available. Uh, the commission uh, issued a public notice earlier this month about the application requirements. So interested applicants can start to collect that information and prepare for the application becoming available. Uh, the commission will announce at a later date when the application filing window will be open and uh, interested applicants can check on the FCC's Connected Care webpage for updates and announcements about the Connected Care Pilot Program. The webpage is, uh, can be found at www.fcc.gov slash Connected Care Pilot. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you, and um, I will be happy to answer questions during the uh, question portion. 
Great. Thank you, Haley. Uh, this is Steve again. Uh, so um, at this time, I'd like to see if there are any questions for panel A. Um, as was mentioned earlier, there's a reactions button at the bottom of your page uh, that you can click on to uh, give me notice of that. Uh, we heard uh, on panel A from uh, Ed, Diane, and now Haley. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, so um, let me uh, close my screen here and uh, Deborah Berlin, um, I'd like to recognize you. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly who this question is for, but first I wanna thank the, the entire uh, Bureau for all the work that you've been doing and uh, particularly the outreach group, I've um, received your updates, your newsletter, and very impressed with everything that you've been doing during this time period. Um, so I do have one question, and I'm not sure if this is for you, Ed, or, or if this is someone else who's on your team. Um, I just wanted to know, there's, of course, a lot of buzz about Lifeline. Uh, and I just wanted to know what update you might have about outreach on Lifeline. I know every year there's an effort to reach out um, with Lifeline and wanted to know if there was any update about that. Hey, Debbie. Um, sorry, it takes a minute to toggle mute and turn your video back on and all that good stuff. But uh, in, in reference to, to Lifeline Outreach, um, Lifeline Awareness Week was earlier this month, and that's a collaborative effort between the FCC, um, NASUCA, and NARUC, I believe. And I apologize if I got the wrong acronym thrown in there. Um, but there were materials prepared for that, information that was sent out um, along those lines. Uh, the outreach team has also done some direct email outreach um, to make sure people are aware of some of the many Lifeline waivers uh, that the commission has put into effect starting back in March and, and updating as needed um, over the past few months. Um, in addition to that, uh, there was a, a joint letter as well that was signed, and, and I apologize, that came from our Intergovernmental Affairs Group as well as our, our Wireline Competition Bureau. Um, but earlier this year, there was a joint letter um, that went was signed with some state um, entities and the chairman to go out about sort of raising awareness about Lifeline, making sure people were aware of the, the waivers that are in place. Okay, well, thank you, Ed. Thanks thank for you, that. De Deborah. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for that update and uh, appreciate the work that everybody does there. Okay, so um, this is Steve again, and I'm back. Um, I'd like to move ahead with uh, panel B. We're pretty much on schedule. So uh, this is on combating uh, robocalls. Um, and the first presentation will be on call blocking report in order by Darusha Burnett, his attorney advisor uh, for the Consumer Advisory Division for the Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau. Um, so let's hear from our speaker. We have the slides up. One moment, I'm trying to get my uh, video unmuted. It doesn't seem to want to let me. I don't know why. Uh, Jerusa, this is Scott. There if it you is. might want to, okay, you got it. Okay, good. Uh, yes, my apologies. Um, 
So this is Jerusha Burnett. Uh, I'm an attorney in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau's Consumer Policy Division. And just a side note, I apologize if my dog starts whining. He's not happy that I shut him out of the room. <laughs> um, so issued in July 2020, the call blocking order adopts two safe harbors for voice service providers that block calls. Both of these safe harbors provide protection from liability under the Communications Act and the Commission's rules. The order also establishes certain protections for callers. The first safe harbor builds on the 2019 declaratory ruling, which made clear that voice service providers may block calls believed to be unwanted based on reasonable analytics on an informed opt-out basis. It then incorporates caller ID authentication information to provide protection from liability for voice service providers that block based on reasonable analytics, which must include caller ID authentication information designed to identify unwanted calls on an informed opt-out basis. The requirement to incorporate caller ID authentication information means that at a minimum, a terminating voice service provider seeking safe harbor must have deployed an effective caller ID authentication framework within their own network except caller ID authentication information transmitted by an upstream voice service provider and incorporate that information into its analytics where that information is available. The terminating voice service provider may also rely on this safe harbor even when blocking uh, where that information is not available so long as it incorporates it into analytics wherever possible. So at this time, only the stir shaken framework qualifies, but the order does leave open the option for other authentication methods to satisfy the required caller ID authentication information component. The second safe harbor provides protection for voice service providers that block all traffic from certain upstream providers that are bad actors. Specifically, if the commission notifies a provider of illegal traffic on their network and that provider fails to effectively mitigate this traffic or fails to implement effective measures, prevent new and renewing customers from using their network to originate illegal calls, then a downstream provider may block calls from this bad actor provider. The order also directs the bad actor provider to notify both the traceback consortium and the commission of the steps they have taken to effectively mitigate the illegal traffic within 48 hours. And we expect the downstream provider to notify the bad actor before blocking calls. As for the established protections, there are three main elements. First, a voice service provider should not block calls to 911. Second, the order directs voice service providers to make all reasonable efforts to ensure that calls from public safety answering points and government outbound emergency numbers are not blocked. And finally, it requires voice service providers to designate a single point of contact to report blocking errors at no charge to callers or other voice service providers. Blocking providers must investigate and resolve these blocking disputes in a reasonable amount of time and at no cost to the caller, so long as the complaint is made in good faith. The item also included an NPRM seeking comment on further implementation of the TRACE Act, including additional blocking and related safe harbors, as well as further protection for both callers and consumers. For example, the NPRM sought comment on matters such as expanding the safe harbor to include network-based blocking of calls that are highly likely to be illegal based on reasonable analytics, and on requiring voice service providers to provide, at the request of a subscriber, a list of blocked calls that were intended for that subscriber's numbers. The reply comment window for this NPRM is still open and it closes on September 29th. Uh, at the end of the panel, I am happy to take questions, though I note that with regards to the open proceeding in the NPRM, uh, I may be unable to take questions on that point. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's, uh... A really interesting topic, and I have another one. It's a call blocking tools report, and this is um, our next speaker is uh, Mika Savir. Uh, she's the attorney advisor for the Consumer Policy Division, Policy Division. of the uh, Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau. Hi, I'd like to uh, thank Scott and Jerusha for having 
Consumer Advisory Committee for the opportunity to talk about the Call Blocking Tools Report. This report was released on June 25, 2020. And uh, call blocking is one way for the voice service providers to reduce the number of illegal and unwanted calls that would otherwise reach consumers. Unwanted robocalls can be annoying and can also be used to perpetuate fraud. The commission has sought to protect American consumers from illegal and unwanted calls by authorizing voice service providers to block such calls in, as a default before they ever reach the consumers. Since 2017, the Commission has permitted voice service providers to block certain likely fraudulent calls. Specifically, in the 2017 call blocking report and order, the Commission authorized voice service providers to block by default at the network level calls using invalid, unallocated, or unused numbers and numbers on the DNO or do not originate list. When the subscriber's number is spoofed by a robocaller without the subscriber's consent, the calls purporting to be from that number are most likely illegal. Subsequently, in the 2019 call blocking declaratory ruling, the commission clarified that voice service providers could offer call blocking services on an opt-out basis to consumers where blocking is based on reasonable analytics designed to identify unwanted calls. The commission also stated that voice service providers may offer to block calls from numbers not in a consumer's contact list on an opt-in basis. On June 25, 2020, the Bureau released the report on the deployment and implementation of call blocking and caller ID implementation. The report was required by the 2019 call blocking declaratory ruling. Specifically, it required that the Bureau prepare a report on the state of deployment of advanced methods and tools to eliminate such calls, including the impact of call blocking on 911 and public safety. The Bureau will issue a second report on these issues in June 2021. In drafting the report, the Bureau sought comment on certain call blocking issues and received comments from voice service providers, third party analytics companies, trade associations, and other parties. Most voice service providers state that following the 2017 call blocking report in order, they block at the network level calls from telephone numbers on the DNO list and calls that appear to be from invalid, unallocated, or unused numbers. And in addition to default network blocking permitted by the 2017 call blocking report in order, most voice service providers offer call blocking and labeling services for unwanted calls on an opt-in or opt-out basis generally th through a third party analytics company partner. Consumers can also obtain call blocking and labeling services directly from such third party analytics companies. While the specific blocking and labeling programs vary, the commission's actions have resulted in greater choice for consumers. For example, wireless carriers offer AT&T's call protect, Verizon's call filter, and T-Mobile's scam ID and scam block. Other voice service providers, such as CenturyLink, Cox, and Comcast, offer their customers a third-party call blocking program from the third-party company, Nomo Robo. The report contains details on the offerings and practices of a number of voice service providers. For the sake of this presentation, let's take a more detailed look at one provider's blocking services. This provider offers call blocking options for wireless and wireline customers. For network-based blocking, it uses fraud investigators to target suspected illegal high volume callers. This provider has blocked several billion such calls in the past few years. In addition to the default network based blocking, this provider offers a call blocking service to wireless customers on an opt out basis. This is offered through a third party analytics company and has blocked or labeled over a billion suspected fraud call calls and over 3 billion other calls. This particular service automatically blocks suspected fraud calls and blocks suspect calls. This provider also offers services to its VOIP customers and has a service that works on all wireline networks and automatically blocks robocalls from ringing while allowing customers to blacklist those names and numbers they want blocked. Up to 1,000 names and numbers. Voice service providers describe their blocking and labeling options on their website. Consumers can also obtain blocking and labeling services directly from third-party analytics companies. So they have blocking options in addition to what their own wireless 
or wireline voice service provider offers. Voice service providers are taking these measures to protect their customers from illegal and unwanted calls and have succeeded in blocking millions of illegal and unwanted calls. The call blocking report available on our website provides a useful summary of the current state of call blocking services offered by voice service providers following the commission's 2017 call blocking report and order and 2019 call blocking declaratory ruling. This is an area that is undergoing a lot of change due to the commission's efforts to protect consumers from robocalls. We will discuss updated information in the 2021 call blocking report next year. I would like to thank the Consumer Advocacy Committee for the opportunity to share this information about call blocking with you. Okay, well, um, thank you, uh, Mika. So we have um, one more presentation before we go to Q&A. Uh, this one is on Hospital Robocall Protection Group. It's Donna Cyrus, she's a designated federal officer for the Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau. Hi there, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I am uh, an attorney advisor in the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs in the FCC's Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. I'm also the designated federal officer for the Hospital Robocall Protection Group. And I will be talking about that this morning. The, on June, June 25th, 2020, the commission established the, uh, one second, please. Um, do I have slides? I should have some slides, right? Sorry, Donna, we'll get those up in just a sec. Okay. Okay. All right, so the first slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. On June 25th, 2020, the commission established the Hospital Robocall Protection Group, or the HRPG, a new federal advisory committee dedicated to combating robocalls to hospitals. Congress directed the FCC to establish the HRPG in the Telephone Robocall Abuse Criminal Enforcement and Deterrence Act of 2019. That's a mouthful, so we refer to it as the TRACE Act. The HRPG also is organized under and operates in accordance with the Federal, Federal Advisory Committee Act or FACA. The TRACE Act requires that the HRPG produce hospital robocall mitigation recommendations no later than the week of December 21st of 2020. Next slide, please. In accordance with the TRACE Act, the HRPG will issue best practices regarding the following, how voice service providers can better combat unlawful robocalls made to hospitals, how hospitals can better, combat, can better protect themselves from such calls, including by using unlawful robocall mitigation techniques, and how the federal government and state governments can help combat such calls. Next slide. HRPG's initial meeting was on July 27th of 2020. Since then, its three working groups have been actively meeting and working to produce the required recommendations. The TRACE Act, 
also requires that the commission complete a proceeding no later than June 2021 to assess the extent to which the voluntary adoption of the best practices can be facilitated to protect hospitals and other institutions. Thank you, I'll, I'll take any questions and more information can be found about um, regarding the HRPG uh, uh, on our page on the FCC's website. I understand uh, all of these links are gonna be provided to you in, in written format or. Okay, do we have any questions for anyone on this panel? Okay, so right. um, so we have, and I'd like to recognize Irene Leach. Um, Irene, if um, you'd like to go ahead and turn on your, your mic um, and let me close mine down. Thanks, Steve. Uh, my question is for Mika. I may have missed it, but do the call blocking services cost the consumer extra or are they included in the base rate? They do not cost extra, although some carriers offer like a higher level of caller ID or something, but just the basic call blocking services do not cost extra. Is that, is that good, Irene? Or Yes, thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. If anyone else uh, would like to ask something for any of the presenters today. Again, the, uh, the question is down, at, you, you hit the toggle at the very bottom, there's a button that says reactions, and then you hit the hand, hand wave. Okay, well, um, seeing none, let's, let's check the time here. Uh, it's just about, um, just about noon. So um, we we're scheduled for um, a lunch break uh, coming up. So um, well, so uh, why don't we um, come back, uh, let's say, let's, let's come back around um, 12, uh, 1235. We'll come back just a little earlier than schedule just to make sure we're keeping up on time. So let's take a break, come back at 1235 and we'll do a countdown to begin. Uh, so uh, let's, let's just break for lunch. Well, welcome back from the lunch break. Uh, it looks like um, we have another panel coming up. This one deals with uh, advancing emergency response capabilities. Uh, and we have uh, two speakers as before. We'll stop at the end of both speakers and, and just take any questions if there are questions. So, uh, so uh, let's begin then. Um, so the first speaker today is uh, PSAP's real-time text capacity by Susie Singleton. She's the Chief Disability Rights Officer for the uh, Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau. So um, Susie, I'm gonna turn my video off and if you pause, uh, I'll leave it up to you to take care of this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, I hope everyone had a great lunch uh, and welcome back. I was invited to speak to you today about real-time text technology and 911 call centers, as you know, public safety answering points or PSAPs. Uh, so we go to the next slide, please. TTY technology uh, has been around since the 1970s for people who rely on text-based communication over the telephone network, mostly people with speech disabilities or people who are deaf or hard of hearing who, or who otherwise are not able to speak. 
The TTY technology, however, was developed for use on that PST and the public switched telephone network. And the FCC implemented rules to clarify that carriers must support TTY technology on their networks. Now, with the advent of the transition to IP-based networks in an IP environment, we've discovered that TTYs do not work well on those networks. There's packet loss, distortion, transmission errors that have significantly impacted the quality of communication. And TTY usage has significantly declined as people have migrated over to using things like smartphones in the wireless environment. So real-time text was recognized as being a possible solution in an IP environment. Uh, and AT&T filed a petition with us, the FCC, to request that we update our rules to transition to RTT. RTT can be fully integrated with mainstream voice communications, that is simultaneous voice and text, and can be used with off-the-shelf devices and uses Unicode character sets, things like emoticons, um, symbols, different language character sets. It is a very advanced technology as compared to TTY. If we go to the next slide, please. In December of 2016, the FCC adopted rules to facilitate the transition from TTYs to RTT over wireless internet protocol technologies, that's IP technologies. Those new rules permitted the support of RTT in lieu of support of those legacy TTYs. Covered entities that support RTT in compliance with the FCC's rules would then be relieved of the requirement to support TTY on all of their wireless networks and equipment, including uh, services and devices used in legacy non-IP environments and facilities. So what are those covered entities? Mainly two, the first are IP-based wireless providers, and the second is the manufacturers of the end user equipment. Next slide, please. Our rules do spell out what the required RTT core functionalities are. In specific, they must be interoperable across networks and services. You must use the RFC 4103 as the safe harbor standard. These must be backwards compatible with TTY. And I, I want to pause a moment here to emphasize the importance of that particular requirement, because most 911 call centers across the country are still mid-transition themselves from legacy networks over to IP networks, that is NG911, next generation 911. At this time, most of them may still be using TTYs because of the requirement under Title II of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. So they are already uh, able to handle TTY calls and would then be able to handle incoming RTT calls. So in that way, you can feel free to reach out to your PSAPs. Um, it's really important to us that we had that backwards compatibility with TTYs for that end. And support for 911 communications, another one of these requirements must be able to contact 911. And then simultaneous text and voice in the same call session, which is a very important function that you'd be able to switch back and forth between a voice call and text call on that same call session. So you don't end up with two separate platforms where if your voice call doesn't work, uh, for example, you've got a shooter or emergency situation where you don't want to be making noise, then you need to switch over and start a new call session. Instead, you have that same line, that same call session that you can toggle back and forth to maintain your safety uh, and effective communication with the uh, 911 in the event of emergency. You must also be able to send and receive calls with the same phone number. Next slide, please. 
the compliance timelines, we had two major timelines, the first for service providers and one for manufacturers. And you'll see those timelines have already passed in particular for carriers. Uh, and for our tier one CMRS providers, which would include the nationwide carriers such as AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint, those carriers are already in compliance now. They have either one of two options in order to be in compliance, a downloadable RTT app or plug-in to support real-time text, or uh, having already implemented a native RTT functionality in their core network offered in at least one handset model that supports RTT, including support of RTT in future design specifications. The non-tier one providers, uh, again, we're talking about not typically nationwide providers, um, it, with the exception of resellers, must be in compliance by June 30th of 2020. We are now reviewing some waiver requests from some of those non-tier one carriers. And uh, that is in the docket. By December 31st of 2019, I'm sorry, this that's already has two, but I, I'm just reading out the text on the slide here. Um, by June 30th, 2021, each non-tier one CMRS provider, including resellers, um, can choose to support our, that chooses to support RTT shall have implemented RTT for all new authorized users and devices. Now for manufacturers, that timeline has also passed December 31st of 2018. For those that choose to support RTT in lieu of TTY support, they shall implement RTT in newly manufactured equipment if readily achievable or not, or unless not achievable. Next slide, please. It's our last one. Now, PSAP readiness for RTT. Please bear in mind that they should already be ready. Um, they have TTYs, and because RTT is meant to be backwards compatible with TTYs, that is one thing to keep in mind. Now, for PSAPs to receive RTT, the FCC has rules that require that carriers deliver text messages to PSAPs that are text capable within six months of a PSAP request. And the FCC maintains a text to 911 uh, registry and RTT will be included once OMB approves. And uh, the comment period for that updated form closed uh, early September 2020 with no opposition. So soon we should be announcing this new feature of our text to 911 registry. And the URL for that is fcc.gov slash text dash two dash 911. The FCC also hosted in October of 2018, a PSAP RTT Awareness Day. I mentioned that because that page is still available on our website and it has a whole host of resources for 911 call centers. And the URL for that is www.fcc.gov slash RTT. On August 3rd of 2020, Nina published a draft titled Nina PSAP Readiness for Real-Time Text Information Document with guidelines for installation and use of RTT in public safety answering points and call centers. The comment period just closed September 11th of 2020. One last thought for you. I'm sure that some of you have been all over the country. Um, California, uh, for example, 
uh, has implemented a law, uh, the 438 PSAPs there under California Government Code Section 53112. By January 1st, 2021, each California PSAP shall be RTT and SMS enabled. That will impact a total of 438 PSAPs. So you can certainly check into your area by looking at the registry. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, after I believe our next speaker. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Susie. I really appreciate that. Uh, so the next speaker, before we go to Q&A, the topic is on national suicide and mental health lifeline. Our speaker, Jesse uh, Goodwin, is the attorney advisor at the Competition Policy Bureau for the Wireline Competition Bureau, uh, excuse me, the Competition Policy Division at the Wireline Competition Bureau. Uh, Jesse? Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse Goodwin, and I'll be presenting on the recent designation of 988 for the purposes of the National Suicide Hotline. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. The FCC has designated 988 for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline to be available July 16th, 2022. 988 is not active yet. If you want to call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, call the current number, which is 1-800-273-TALK. The presentation today will cover uh, the background to designating 988, the NPRM that led to our report and order, and the next steps that will be occurring. Next slide, please. Uh, did we skip a slide or? No, okay, there we go. Um, so in August, uh, August 14th, 2018, Congress passed the National Suicide Hotline Improvement Act of 2018, which tasked the FCC with examining and reporting on the technical feasibility of designating a shorter number, a simple, easy to remember three digit dialing code for a national suicide prevention and mental health crisis hotline. One year later, FCC staff, in consultation with the North American Numbering Council, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and Department of Veterans Affairs, released a report recommending the FCC initiate a rulemaking to adopt 988 as a single purpose three digit code for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Next slide, please. So why did we choose 988? Uh, we found that it was a unique three-digit code and so obviates the need to age an existing N11 code, for example, something like 511, 611, 711, et cetera, and should reduce the overall implementation timeline. We also found that a wholly unique three-digit code would be less disruptive to existing users, that consumer education campaigns for a unique three-digit code would be simpler and likely more effective than those necessary for repurposing or expanding use of an existing N11 code. And that 988 is less technically complicated than using other unique three-digit dialing codes. Next slide, please. On December 16th, 2019, the FCC released a notice of a proposed rulemaking that proposed to designate 988 as the three-digit dialing code for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. We received a robust record of comments from the mental health community, telecommunications companies, and other interested parties. And on July 16th, 2020, the FCC adopted a report and order that adopted 988 as the three-digit code for the lifeline and required providers to implement 988 within two years. Next slide, please. The order requires all telecommunication carriers, interconnected voice over internet protocol providers, and one-way VoIP providers to make any network changes necessary to ensure 
that users can dial 988 to reach the lifeline by July 16th, 2022. Providers will route calls to 988 to the existing toll-free access number, which again is 1-800-273-TALK or 8255. It requires that cover providers implement 10-digit dialing in areas that both use seven-digit dialing and 988 as the first three digits of a number. The North American Numbering Plan Administrator is currently working with providers toward implementation. Next slide, please. If you're in need of non-voice communication, there are several ways to get help. There are several text messaging options for suicide prevention that are available nationwide, including a short code to reach the Veterans Crisis Line, which is 838-255, and the Nonprofit Crisis Text Line, which is 741741. The Lifeline offers online chat as well and maintains a separate TTY number. The FCC did not mandate text messaging or direct video calling to 988 because it does not control the features of the lifeline. Next slide, please. Oh, and uh, that concludes oh, the presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions during the Q&A. Okay, great. Um, so um, as before, if you have questions, um, please um, signal it to me so I can uh, see your raised hand and, and call on you. Okay, so uh, I'd like to, before I turn off my screen here, I'd like to uh, recognize Irene Leach uh, who has a question. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Jesse, why does it take two years to implement this? So there are a number of things that need to be done before 988 can be available nationwide. Um, on the technology side of things, there are just issues with a variety of types of switches, namely legacy switches, that either need to be upgraded or replaced outright in order to support a new short code like 988. Um, additionally, there are just other sort of logistical hurdles that we need to make sure are taken care of before implementation. For example, we wanna make sure that there's enough time for the lifeline to get staff and resources um, necessary to handle the increased call capacity that we expect will occur. And just in general, we found that the date we set was the earliest technically feasible date that we could. Um, we recognize the pressing need to get 988 implemented nationwide as soon as possible, um, but we also have to bear in mind the technical challenges that come along with that. As I brought up during the presentation as well, there is also the issue of 10-digit dialing. Uh, there are many places across the country that currently have permissive seven-digit dialing. That means they don't have to dial in the area code before they put in a number. The issue is when there is currently a number that uses 988 as part of that seven digit code. In order to deal with that issue, because for example, if you're trying to dial a phone number that starts with 988, but is followed by four digits, you need to somehow be able to differentiate between that and if you're trying to dial into the lifeline. And so the solution is to simply move to 10 digit dialing. And I say simply, but it in fact, can be somewhat complicated, it takes time, resources, and in recognition of that fact, again, we found that the two-year time frame that we adopted was the earliest technically feasible date that we could set. Okay, any other, uh, any other uh, uh, questions? This is Steve again. Okay, so uh, we're still pretty much on time. So this is good. We have uh, one more panel uh, we wanna get through here. It's um, on promoting 21st century technologies and services. Uh, and for this, we have two speakers. Um, one topic is uh, spectrum and infrastructure policies to accelerate access 
to Spectrum and 5G deployment. So this is Susan Mort uh, will be addressing us. She's the legal and policy advisor for the uh, uh, Wireless uh, Telecommunications Bureau. Uh, Susan? Uh, Susan, can you uh, turn your mic on, please? How's that? Is that better, Steve? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And apologies, my camera also seems to be a bit out of whack. Um, and uh, also, let me apologize in advance before I get started. Um, there's construction going on in my apartment building, um, and they've been using a jackhammer. They seem to be on the break, um, but it could start up. So I'm sorry if you have any difficulties hearing me during the presentation. Again, my name is Susan Mort. I'm a legal and policy advisor in the Wireless Bureau here at the FCC. And I'm pleased to be here today to talk to you about what the commission is doing to spur 5G deployment in the US. On the first slide, Thank you so much. Uh, so I wanted to talk, start out by talking about what are the impacts of 5G. And it's not just, as you'll see from the image on the screen, towers with small cell transmitters. There's a real potential imp a beneficial impact for our economy at large. Different studies estimate that there will be 3 million new jobs, 275 billion in private investment, I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty seeing the full screen. And billions in new economic growth in the United States. Connection speeds are anticipated to be over 10 gigabits per second, which is 100 times faster than 4G. Lag times are anticipated to be one-tenth of what they are today. So that'll be moving from 50 milliseconds to one millisecond. 5G will also enable smart cities and smart transportation networks that reduce traffic, prevent accidents, and limit pollution. It'll also make possible wireless healthcare and remote surgeries, precision agriculture, industry automation, and of course, any number of new innovations that are yet to be imagined. So on the next slide, I wanted to talk a bit about the 5G Fast Plan, which is Chairman Pai's initiative to accelerate, just like the speedometer that you see uh, pushing forward towards 5G deployment. That is the market-based U.S. approach that the FCC has undertaken to promote 5G innovation, investments, and deployment. There are three key components. The first being pushing more spectrum into the marketplace. The second, updating infrastructure policy, the third, modernizing outdated regulations. And through all of these different prongs, we've taken different steps over the last couple of years. And as a result, the rollout of 5G systems is underway nationwide. Moving on to the next slide. You'll see that we have a chart here, which uh, identifies different FCC spectrum actions that have been undertaken in recent years for 5G use. And these go across from high band, mid band, low band, and also in the unlicensed space. Now high band spectrum basically travels short distances at high capacity with fast speeds. Low band travels longer distances with less bandwidth. Mid band unsurprisingly sits somewhere in the middle. But we're implementing different actions throughout all these different spectrum ranges, as well as in the unlicensed space, to make sure that there's a variety of different applications and utilities available so that having spectrum that is in these different areas will enable different uses. Let me first talk about the high band range, where there have been a number of different auctions in recent years particularly in the 28 gigahertz band, that auction was completed in January, 2019. 
the 24 gigahertz band, which was completed in May 2019. And most recently, in March of this past year, we had the largest auction in US history releasing 3,400 megahertz of spectrum into the commercial marketplace across the 37 gigahertz, 39 gigahertz, and 47 gigahertz bands. In addition to these high band efforts, in the last couple of years, we've also undertaken a number of different mid band initiatives. And I'm actually personally working on a couple of these. So I'd like to talk in a little more detail about some of those. Specifically in the 2.5 gigahertz band, uh, this is a band where the service formerly known as the educational broadband service, um, because of certain eligibility and use restrictions historically had not been fully utilized particularly in the Western portion of the United States. So in reimagining and modernizing this band for future uses, the commission did three things. First, the eligibility and use restrictions were eliminated both for existing licensees and for new licensees going forward to enable more flexible uses. Second, the commission opened a rural tribal priority window and what this window uh, did, it ran from uh, February of this year till earlier this month, till September 2nd. And it afforded an opportunity for federally recognized tribes to apply for licenses at no cost in terms of no application fees, no need to go through an auction, could simply apply for licenses for any unassigned 2.5 gigahertz spectrum uh, within the former EBS service that was open over their rural tribal lands. The last prong of the reimagining of this band involves a commercial auction of any unassigned spectrum that remains when existing licensees as well as successful tribal licensees are taken into account. We're particularly pleased with the rural tribal window because we had over 400 applicants and earlier uh, this month, we were able to put 157 of those applications already out uh, as accepted for filing. And so our goal in part is part of this reimagining of this band is to afford opportunities to entities other than traditional carriers to gain access to spectrum and particularly to bridge the digital divide in rural tribal areas. In a similar but different way, uh, our approach in other bands such as 3.45 to 3.55 gigahertz, 3.5 gigahertz, and 3.7 to 4.0 gigahertz have also taken different approaches. In the 3.5 gigahertz band, uh, what has been done is that there is a multi-tiered sharing system where there will be both incumbent users Earlier this year, there was an auction for priority licenses. But there's also a significant portion, almost half of that band, that's being reserved for general authorized access. And what that means is you wouldn't need a formal license. We call it license by rule. Uh, but basically, um, anyone who's using compliant equipment and signs up with one of the FCC authorized spectrum access systems and follows the, the compliance rules of the band is able to use that spectrum. There's not the same level of interference protection as with the other licensed services, but it does provide an easy uh, and kind of low barrier to entry for folks to gain access to spectrum. So these are just examples of some of the uh, new approaches that we're taking to make sure that spectrum is available for 5G use particularly in the mid band because that is prime spectrum for 5G applications. I'll mention just quickly in the low band range that we are making targeted changes or have made targeted changes in the 600 megahertz, 800 megahertz, and 900 megahertz bands to improve use of low band spectrum for 5G. And across all the different spectrum ranges, we're looking at opportunities for unlicensed uh, use of spectrum. Uh, that would enable, for example, Wi-Fi in the six gigahertz, 61 to 71 gigahertz, and above 95 gigahertz bands. We're also taking a fresh and comprehensive look at the 5.9 gigahertz band that has been reserved for use by dedicated short-range communications. 
Moving on to the next slide. I'd like to talk a bit about infrastructure siting and review. Um, we have um, an image of a tower uh, transmitting to different uh, buildings in an urban environment. And indeed, um, one of our primary goals is to make sure that there are facilities available uh, for 5G services and that they're able to be quickly deployed. Um, so we've taken a couple of different approaches to facilitating the review of these infrastructure projects. At the federal level, the FCC has modernized federal historic preservation and environmental reviews of wireless deployments. At the state and local level, the commission has removed regulatory barriers such as unreasonable application fees. And we also instituted two new shot clocks for small wireless facilities. On the next slide, I would like to just talk for a minute about one specific topic in the infrastructure sphere, uh, that is the Section 6409 uh, proceeding. Uh, Section 6409A of the Spectrum Act streamlines state and local government review of certain requests to modify transmission equipment on existing structures. In June of this year, the Commission adopted a declaratory ruling clarifying that when the 60 day shot clock for local review begins, and how certain aspects of proposed modifications might impact the eligibility for streamlined review under the rules. The FCC adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking, seeking comment on proposed rule changes regarding excavation and deployment outside the boundaries of an existing tower site and the effects of such activities on eligibility for streamlined review. Separate from clarifying the rules on streamlined local review, the declaratory ruling clarified a portion of the FCC's rules on environmental and historic preservation review that differed from most other federal agencies. And again, the, the hope with this is to make sure that um, infrastructure deployments are able um, to move forward uh, quickly so that we can get 5G services off. And as you'll see on the screen, uh, there's a number of creative ways um, that are being employed, including using uh, palm trees um, as uh, facto towers um, for small cell transmitters. On the next slide, I wanted to finish by talking about the last prong of the 5G FAST plan, which is modernizing outdated regulations. Now, some of these uh, may not necessarily jump out as having a direct connection to wireless deployments, but all modern communications networks ultimately have different components and wireless networks need to connect to backhaul and to the internet backbone to provide connectivity. So ultimately all of these different efforts do contribute to 5G and wireless deployment. So in the one touch make ready space, the FCC has updated its rules governing the attachment of new network equipment to utility poles in order to reduce cost and speed up 5G backhaul deployment. In terms of speeding the IP transition, the FCC revised its rules to make it easier for companies to invest in next generation networks and services instead of the fading networks of the past. And from a business data perspective, in order to incentivize investment in modern fiber networks, the FCC updated its rules for high speed dedicated services by lifting rate regulation where appropriate. And that, um, moving to the last slide is uh, the end of my formal presentation. Um, it's certainly the commission's hope um, that as we move forward with different policies that will enable connected cities um, and rural communities across the country. Um, and um, we hope to continue uh, the US's leadership in 5G deployment. So thank you. And I would be happy to answer any questions uh, after Audra finishes her presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Uh, this is Steve again. Um, so for our final speaker today, we're going to deal with the issue of the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund and the 5G Fund for Rural America. Our speaker is Audra Hale Maddox. She's the Chief of Staff for the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force, OEA, the Office of Economics and Analytics. So Audra, Please take it away.
All right, my video is turned off by the admin. There we go. Hello, everyone. So we can go to the first slide. So what I'm going to talk about today is the expansion by the FCC of um, 5G services, high quality um, internet connections into rural areas via um, what we call the Universal Service Fund. So everybody sees Universal Service Fund charges on your, your phone bills or on your cell phone bills. It's just uh, you know, a few cents per line per month. And all of those funds are combined into um, sort of the same pot. And what the FCC did with USF funds for a very long time after they started collecting them was that, um, that they used those funds to support running individual phone lines to individual homes. Um, and so in 2011, the FCC did a major overhaul of their USF programs in determining that USF funding could be used to support um, extending not just voice, but broadband services. Um, and so since that point, since the transformation order was issued in 2011, the FCC has been working on using universal service funds um, to support the expansion of both fixed broadband, individual you know, lines to homes, and mobile broadband um, in, in rural areas, areas that either are difficult to serve for geographic reasons or areas that are difficult to serve for economic reasons. And um, the, the mechanism that we've been using to do that extension of service has been competitive bidding to distribute that support um, in, in the most efficient way. So can we look at the next slide? So the competitive bidding that we've been using, everybody is familiar with the concept of, of an auction where you sell something for the, the highest price that you can, can collect. But what the FCC has been using to disperse funding for um, broadband services are what's called reverse auctions, where essentially we ask providers to tell us for specific geographic regions that have been predefined before the auction, what is sort of the lowest support amount that they can use to serve that specific block or that specific geographic area to the performance standards that we're requiring for, for that particular auction. Um, and so reverse auction helps us to compare bids in different areas throughout the country to serve the broadest area possible with um, the most efficient use of the funding that we have. And so the first reverse auctions that were used to distribute USF funds were in 2012, the Mobility Fund won, and then in 2014, um, the Tribal Mobility Fund won. And so those programs were sort of jump starts um, to sort of get us off and running in the process of using reverse auctions to distribute USF funds for specifically broadband purposes. Um, and so that was one-time funding for one-time new construction projects, not ongoing funding for um, service provision over an extended period of time. Next slide. So we've moved into wireline reverse auctions as well. So in 2014, um, we started with the Connect America Fund and the Connect America Fund um, cost model auctions um, did some studies and estimated costs of providing services to specific locations within specific hard to serve census blocks and blocks that were above a specified benchmark average cost um, were, were eligible for the cost model program. And then in 2015, they offered that model-based support to price cap carriers. So that is um, carriers that had been receiving legacy support were offered specific amounts per area based on 
what FCC economists had determined was um, a reasonable model basis of support for a particular area. And so nine carriers accepted over one and a half billion dollars a year to serve 3.6 million homes and businesses in the specific areas that had been allotted for that auction um, by the end of 2020 um, in 45 different states and in one territory. And so by the end of this year, we'll be getting reporting on the last served locations within that extension of service. Next slide. And then we have in process um, rural broadband auctions. Um, phase two of the Connect America Fund um, was just completed um, within the last year and we're still in the process of authorizing the last funding that had been won in that auction. And that auction is distributing about one and a half billion dollars over 10 years for fixed broadband and voice services to specific locations. And then the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund is just getting going right now. Um, we have just as of the 23rd of September, closed the window for entities seeking to participate in the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund auction um, to get their applications completed so that they can be approved to participate. And that auction is, um, extending up to $16 billion of funding um, in an auction that starts on October the 29th of this year. Um, and any funds that aren't expended during phase one of that auction will then be up for grabs in phase two of the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund auction, which will include an, a fresh $4.4 billion of funding and then any funds that remain from phase one. And you may ask, why would there be funds remaining? And that's because um, when, we're, when we're doing an auction, we have to get as close to the total funding as we can without going over. And so if there aren't sort of bids that can fill that gap exactly to the, to the dollar line of the, the funds that are included in that auction, then we might have to go slightly under the total that had been allotted um, in order to award the funds. And also entities that bid and have winning bids in our auctions sometimes determine in the post auction process that either they didn't do their research properly and they can't serve the area that they had a winning bid in or their business needs change. They get an offer they can't refuse to sell their business. Um, and so, you know, there are many different reasons why entities may default on winning bids in one of the FCC's auctions, either before they ever get started on a project or at some point while they're building that project out. So any funds that are left over from phase one, we've gone ahead and set up, they will just wash into phase two. And then we've proposed the 5G fund for rural America. Um, and so the commission is using that program to look at extending wireless mobile um, broadband funding into rural America for 5G. Um, and so that fund has been proposed. It hasn't been adopted, um, but it has been proposed to extend up to $9 billion um, for 5G service um, with up to $1 billion in a second round um, to facilitate precision agriculture in um, specific regions of the country. Next slide. And so the 5G fund is um, a little bit different than what we've done in some of our other USF auctions because most of the time when we are using USF funds to push out service and technology, we are sort of gap filling for areas that haven't already been served because there's a commercial case to serve there. And so with 5G, because this technology is so new anywhere, there are lots of you know, urban areas where there's plenty economic case to serve, but just the technology isn't there yet. Um, all the, the build out that the previous speaker was talking about, um, sort of clearing the way to get the infrastructure set up and um, to, to make it possible for that service to be extended hasn't happened even in areas where it's perfectly commercially viable to, to run that service. 
And so the commission has really committed to making sure that rural America doesn't get left behind while urban America extends to 5G that supports, you know, extremely quick video, real-time telehealth, students and businesses operating, you know, in real time with less latency and, um, and greater sustain for their programs. Um, we don't want to sort of wait until 5G has been rolled out to everywhere that's commercially viable and then come and fill those holes with, um, with a USF program. We're trying to be aggressive in getting ahead of um, the market and looking at the most difficult to serve areas and getting 5G to those areas with USF funding. So next slide. And so when we're looking at how do we fund mobile wireless 5G and make sure that we're only sending that funding to areas that really need it when areas that don't need it also don't have that service yet. And so we're looking at determining eligibility by the degree of how rural an area is versus eligibility by coverage. And since we can't use 5G coverage to determine what would be eligible, um, we asked for comment from the public and from providers on the possibility of using other coverage as proxies for areas that might be easily served with 5G without needing USF funding. So um, for example, if an area already has unsubsidized 4G LTE, could we say that the existence of that service not subsidized means that's an area that can be served commercially and doesn't need USF funding? Um, and so we're, we're weighing different ways to determine eligibility to make sure that this funding is distributed in the most efficient way. And then we're also weighing and have asked for public comment on an adjustment factor to sort of put a weight on the scale in the auction to preference either very difficult terrain or particularly economically difficult to serve rural areas. Um, there are rural areas that are say very sparsely populated, but the population that is there is very wealthy owns, you know, extremely large ranches or ski resorts or, you know, that sort of, um, you know, high producing economic value areas. And so just looking at degree of population without looking at the, you know, sort of relative wealth of that population um, might lead to improper incentives in, in what areas that we make eligible. So we're really trying to fine tune eligibility for this 5G funding. Um, and then sort of one of the, the biggies uh, that was maybe surprising for providers um, that we rolled out as part of this 5G fund proposal is that way back in 2011, the commission told legacy USF funding recipients that the commission had the intention to um, impose additional public interest obligations, additional performance requirements, additional reporting requirements on legacy support recipients. And so we, we raised that flag in 2011, but we haven't rolled those um, requirements out. And so in our asking for comment on the 5G fund, we've also asked for comment on rolling out a scheme of public interest obligations for legacy support recipients as well. Thank you. Well, great. So uh, at this time, um, if anyone has any questions for um, Audra or um, uh, Susan, um, please raise your hand to be noticed. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Johnny Campus, I, I just noticed you have a hand up. Uh, please go ahead. I wanted to ask Susan, um, what kind of metrics, uh, do you have any kind of good metrics showing how uh, the chairman's fast plan is working, how well it's working? Thank you.
Um, if I understand your question, um, you're asking how we're taking a look at, at how effective that particular plan has been. Well, everything is still in motion, and there are, as I mentioned, different fronts in terms of um, promoting spectrum deployment as well as infrastructure deployment. So these are rapidly changing every day, um, and um, but by all accounts, what we're hearing certainly from carriers on the infrastructure side, as well as um, the successful um, auctions that have been conducted um, and other uh, implementations that are in process on the spectrum side, um, it is our belief that um, these are all successful initiatives in terms of actually um, analyzing it. Um, that is, we do have um, different reports that we, we do issue every single year looking at the state of broadband deployment. And um, those factors are, are taken into account. Um, but um, these are ultimately, it's a very rapidly changing um, environment. Um, so um, it's, it's constantly changing um, from day to day. So it makes it a little bit hard to track um, other than taking those periodic snapshots. Okay, um, unless there's anything else, um, you know, we'll take a, we'll just take a couple minutes uh, for a break. Uh, everyone can just get up and stretch and uh, why don't we start back, uh, let's see, what time is it now? Um, 1.34, let's just start back like at, at uh, 1.37. So we'll just take a few minutes and we'll start promptly. So we'll give everyone a moment just to stretch their legs, thanks. So um, this being the, uh, the last meeting for the 10th um, CAC charter, um, you know, while the FCC is, uh, had a public notice on the intent to renew and uh, um, uh, re to renew a new charter and has already solicited nominations. Um, uh, you know, at this point, we're sort of awaiting approval. So I have nothing to report. Um, uh, in a few minutes, I'll turn it over to um, to Scott to see if he has anything he wants to say on this. But um, so that's kind of uh, where I think we stand, um, and we'll hear more if that's if there is more there. Uh, but I, what I'd like to say is um, uh, at this time, uh, I just want to open up the floor for a second to um, any of the um, CAC members um, just to see if they have anything they wish to discuss. Um, before we open up for public comment. Uh, again, as before, just uh, raise your hand. And here, let me turn my uh, video off. Okay, Irene, I see you have your hand up. Um, uh, please comment. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the efforts uh, related to trying to get uh, broadband to rural areas um, still have uh, a lot of concern uh, about whether the incentives are there to really get done what is needed. Uh, and I put some comments in the in the chat. Um, so when you, you didn't see my hand uh, for uh, the previous panel. But anyway, um, I, I, I still think we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and until we do, these areas are going to really have trouble being self-sufficient economically. Uh, and certainly what we've been learning in COVID has just um, multiplied and reinforced where things are. And I had an experience earlier this week where my, um, some somebody decided that uh, I could move to using Word and all of those things in the cloud, uh, but I can't get enough internet uh, at home that I can afford, uh, that I can use that. In fact, I have to turn all of the automatic things off 
uh, and through COVID, I've been driving to work just so I could get access to the internet. And if I could tell you the things that my students and some living uh, in towns and in urban areas, um, our system really still needs a lot of work. Uh, in fact, just yesterday, I had students who were within the town of Blacksburg who internet wouldn't give them uh, what they needed uh, and they, they weren't able to participate in class and were struggling with the technology. So um, the real life situation is that there's some wonderful things out there, uh, but uh, a lot of people in a lot of places uh, and many of them are not so uh, terribly rural and you wouldn't necessarily assume you, you think they'd be covered and, and they're not. And so we, we've really got a long way to go, but um, anybody who needs uh, to get a shot of what needs to be done, I'd be glad to host you out here uh, in uh, Southwestern Virginia or Central Virginia where the family farm is to show you what we're really dealing with. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Irene. Uh, Mark Del Falco, I, I noticed you had a hand up. Hi, Mark Del Falco at the Appalachia Regional Commission. I, I just want to echo, you know, kind of what Irene is saying there. And, you know, we, we, we run to this exact same issue throughout our entire region where, you know, folks don't have the connectivity. But I think another side of this is the FCC has been doing a good job of trying to, through their various subsidy mechanisms, the CAF and now the RDOF, in, in trying to expand the connectivity into these rural areas. But, you know, I think the bandwidth that we're putting out there, you know, might not be enough because what we're starting to hear is that, you know, because of COVID and because of work at home and because of virtual learning with kids, uh, the, the uplink speeds or the upstream, you know, is very important because people are having to get onto their virtual private networks at work and uh, you know, Zoom meetings and Blackboard and all the other uh, things that need to be done. And the upload speeds that are coming out of the current subsidy programs are really not sufficient. And we, we kind of have this process of funding a network like 10-1 and then going back and funding it again at 25-3 and now finding that you know three upload is not going to not going to cut it, so we're 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 going back and doing everything again and again and again, and I don't have an answer to that. The answer takes more money to do it right, um, but I, I mean I just think we need to look at what we're doing and finding is it really working for rural America because they clearly are still being left behind. Thank you. No, thank you both uh, for those comments. Um, so um, this is Steve back again. Uh, so um, at this moment, I think um, what I'd like to do is uh, just see if we have any comments from the public. Uh, Catherine, is somebody monitoring that? Yes, Catherine, is, this is Scott uh, with the commission. Uh, Catherine's been monitoring that. I checked with her a few minutes ago and we did not have any questions at that time. Um, and I'm sure she'll interrupt us if, if that changes. You know, Steve, congratulations on uh, almost the conclusion of another successful CAC meeting. And uh, you and I are the two guys now that are in the way of adjournment. You realize that? Yeah. I, but you know, <laughs> I, 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 I have to say, though, you know, I, I think by and large, you know, as this meeting winds down, we, we realize that we've uh, completed our work, but we really, I mean, I really want to recognize uh, all the CAC members and all the- I do, I do too. Go ahead. You first, boss. Yeah. You first. And, yeah. yeah and, and, and really the, all the hard work they did this year, a lot of time, a lot of very short deadlines and, and several key recommendations. Uh, I'm, I'm really profoundly grateful to all of you. Uh, Deborah Berlin, I- I just want to say, you know, thanks so much for your guidance and experience and support. I really appreciate your help. And, and Scott, uh, before I turn this over to you, I just wanted to take a moment just 
uh, to thank you for all your hard work and your tremendous support that you've provided me over the years uh, to you and Greg and David and Catherine and Patrick and all the FCC staff for making this possible, not to mention you know, the, uh, uh, the technical uh, help that we had in just getting you know, everything put together here for uh, I think a successful 10th uh, charter. So um, at this point, uh, Scott, uh, let me turn it over to you uh, for some sure. closing remarks. Sure, Steve, thank you very much. And thank you for your kind words. And I could not echo them any louder. Um, you, you've heard a lot of thank yous here today and, and there are, are an awful lot of people uh, that are involved in, in putting these many parts together that uh, makes a, a successful consumer advisory committee. And you know, the committee has been around since March of 2001. I was privileged to be around here at that time when this whole idea started. We didn't have a DAC then. We had a, a disability advisory committee for many years until the CVAA came into existence and rightfully so. There was so much work we had to split off into another committee to be able to handle it all on the disability side, but have been very glad to have our, our, our members with disabilities here. Uh, with us too, because folks with disabilities are consumers too. Um, I'm always amazed at how much time you put into this process. And I'm also amazed at the conversations that take place at the working group level, where people of different points of view will hash a topic out and sometimes agree, sometimes not agree, but I think we've been pretty successful at coming up with some recommendations that, that, that both sides can, can, uh, can subscribe to. And thus, those are the recommendations that ultimately get uh, considered by this fall committee and then passed on to the commission. So I think I've Yes, we are an advisory committee, but the one big collateral advantage is that conversation that happens about these incredibly difficult, complicated topics that the, that the uh, commission handles. And I'm always amazed too at these meetings about my colleagues from uh, CPB and from the CGB who and other bureaus too, who share their expertise with us, with you, so that the recommendations from this committee can be all the better informed with information. And you combine that with, with the expertise around the table that we've had over the years, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. And, and I wanna thank you for all of that I also want to acknowledge uh, the, the, the CAC team that I work with the closest to. I couldn't do it without you, uh, Catherine and, and, and Greg uh, and um, others and, and the senior management in CGB, David and Mark and Kurt and of course, Patrick. And of course, our, our many friends who are in senior positions at the FCC all over the agency. Former CAC people, you know who I'm talking about. People like uh, Ed Bartholomew, uh, Diane Byrne, Burstein, and others who have been uh, CAC members and leaders in their own right during these past uh, 20 years. And of course, I want to recognize the the folks behind the scenes, the best in class interpreting group that we have and uh, under the leadership of Gerard, uh, our friends who run our, our CMR and our audio visual operations so well, Jeff and his crew and Ben Thompson with our IT department who helps with uh, a lot of our training needs and such. It all kind of works together at the end of the day. A uh, couple of last thoughts on my part and then we'll take any questions you might have and um, then I guess we can adjourn. Um, as you know, we had a public solicitation for 
the 11th term of this committee uh, this past summer. And those applications are being reviewed and I expect that an announcement will be made um, hopefully soon uh, about numbers for the new, the new CAC starting in October. Um, we also at the same time had to get our charter renewed uh, federal advisory committees run on a two year cycle, as you know. And um, uh, we, we had to get the charter uh, reviewed by uh, the General Services Administration that oversees the 10,000 plus advisory committees across government. Um, and they are looking at our charter now and uh, we expect that we'll have that approval uh, shortly as well, and we'll be able to announce uh, the 11th term of the committee starting in October. So I don't know, Steve, any other questions uh, or any hands up uh, that, you know, anybody wants to ask us a question or uh, uh, where uh, any other concerns at this point in time? Well, I mean, certainly, again, I just wanted to say, Scott, um, you know, Greg, Catherine, um, everyone on the team, thank you so much for uh, helping the, uh, with this uh, uh, run so smoothly this year. Um, so let's see here at this point. I have one last question, I guess I should ask then is- Sure you should, <laughs> go ahead. Is there any business? Ah, yes, any new business. Is there any new business? Okay, well, hearing and seeing none, uh, the Consumer Advisory Committee is adjourned. And with that, thanks to everyone, farewell and take care. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, everybody. Appreciate all everybody's help with the meeting today. Um,